Welcome to Molecules to Medicine, and thank you all for attending. My name is Dan Barabino, and I'm the Business Development Director for Crystal Pharma Tech. Molecules to Medicine is our webinar series describing success stories of accelerated drug development through collaboration. Today's session will be a panel discussion with senior leaders from TCG Green Camp. Can do pharmaceuticals and crystal pharmatech. Future sessions will focus on collaboration success stories as told by subject matter experts in drug discovery and development. Please be sure to register at the Crystal Pharmatech website or through our LinkedIn page. Our panel features over 100 years of drug development experience. Dr. Robert Wenslow, Vice President, Co founder, and Head of US Operations for Crystal Pharmatech. Dr. Young Chang Lee, co founder and CEO of Candu Pharmaceuticals. Dr. Joe Armstrong, Executive Vice President of TCG Green Chem. And Dr. Chris Sedanayaka, founder and CEO of TCG Green Chem. Chris was called out of town this week and he's not, not able to participate on Zoom, but he is on the line and we'll engage him in participation if it's practical. The format of today's webinar will start with a short presentation summarizing the molecules to medical medicine concept. Following the presentation, we'll have a quick poll to understand what you, the audience, is most interested in hearing about. I'll then open the discussion to the panel based on the responses to the poll. We encourage your use of the question panel and we'll try to get as many questions as possible. If we're not able to get to your specific questions, one of us will follow up by email. I'll now turn it over to Bob for the first part of the presentation. Thanks, Dan. And uh, I'll have control here in just a second. Give me one second. Oh. Great. Okay. So, mo molecules, the medicine. Uh, what are we talking about? And, you know, what is different from the, any current development processes? Uh, what we're talking about here is a true drug development engine where we're accelerating the molecules in the medicine. And it's about getting the right people at the table to make high level decisions to move your program along and so we need strategic thinkers with operational excellence in these four areas in particular process research and drug substance solid state research pharmaceutical sciences and drug product and analytical research and we need individuals and teams that have a lot of large pharma experience and really pushing compounds and accelerating compounds through development. And these individuals are look, always looking ahead, several moves ahead, looking for a line of sight of the compound and also doing many of the tasks in parallel. And these individuals will drive the entire process and make strategic decisions on the process and what specifically does that mean and really here i give an outline of say potentially how we would work in a collaborative partnership uh, instead of a large uh, say single cro type mindset and uh, the key here is really we're doing a lot of the development in parallel and you don't have departments that are working in silos. So even though a lot of larger pharma companies say they have all of these capabilities and they do have all these capabilities, they do have subject matter experts, but the subject matter experts typically sit in, in certain silos and don't really work on development teams to push the compound forward. And this is the type of collaborative partnership that we wanna be pushing. For instance, getting the material, getting the compound early on with our type of collaborative partnership, we can start making material ahead of time that 
can then be used for specific parallel types of studies. And you can have several types of materials that are made and agree upon uh, what that material is to be used for. Because each, each part or each swim lane here depends on data from other, uh, other departments and other uh, subject matter experts. For instance, choosing the API phase can't be done without the formulator. It can't be done without the process chemist. Whereas what we see now a lot is pharma, uh, development companies looking at these as unit operations and doing, say, a salt selection, then doing a formulation development and doing the process chemistry, uh, process research in uh, uh, not in a parallel fashion and not having the individuals talking to one another. Um, and so, you know, this really increases the speed. And uh, Joe's going to start talking about how this is really going to uh, crunch up the accelerating the timeline to phase one. But uh, really, we want to talk about the speed and uh, efficient handoffs uh, at each step. And um, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Joe uh, Armstrong to give a little background about uh, the drug development engine. Hey, Bob, thank you very much. And just to highlight what you said on the previous slide of those different swim lanes of different responsibilities, what people need to do in parallel efforts, specifically from, you know, typically currently different CROs providing that service. One of the things we want to highlight on this slide is really the mantra of the drug development engine accelerating molecules to medicines. And what is the drug development engine? The drug development engine is a collaborative effort of subject matter, magic, magic subject matter experts that would sit in formulation, that sit in process research, and that sit in solid state science with analytical research binding it together. If you look at this slide, this slide shows very well how the acceleration occurs. The first thing that allows acceleration is the black box where the dot is now showing the acceleration in process research. Note that that curve for process research is very steep, a very steep slope versus the other curves. That's important because what we've been able to do at TCG GreenCam, with the years of experience with myself and Chris Naniaki from Beringer, Ingelheim, and et cetera, we have learned how to accelerate process research in a way that we can make the API very quickly. And to what Bob related on the previous slide, having small amounts of API come out working with the, for, the, the formulation people like can do, working with Crystal Pharmatech like a Bob Winslow to understand solid state and pre-formulation with material coming from the process chemist. That allows all that information to be combined together, thus accelerating going into phase one. Because many times what has happened, a company sees these as unit operations, as Bob says. So you have one operation here, you're making the API with this company. One operation, you're going to do the solid state with this company. This company, you're doing the pre-formulation for the safety assessment vehicle, and they're going to do phase one. But they don't talk together. You don't have anyone pulling all that information together, because by pulling it together, you accelerate. So what we're proposing today is to bring a platform for people to think about and understand that by using the collaborative nature of the expertise that we have, we can then take your molecule from lead optimization, accelerate that through into phase one and beyond. So what this chart shows, if we can do that with the process research capabilities that we have here with TCG Green Chem and collaborate in a team effort like what we used to call early development teams back in the days of Merck and BI and et cetera, those representative subject magic experts come together, share data, talk about data, and understand strategic decisions that can then be made to bring that API to, be, to bear with the right form, so support it for the formulation, and accelerate to phase one. So all those other arrows then accelerate to the left, and then you can take months off getting a compound into phase one than typical. So with that said, I've kind of give you an overview of how we believe the drug development engine, the collaborative nature of our three companies, for example, can then accelerate your molecule to become a medicine. So Dan, let me kick it back to you now, and you can give the, um, you know, the, the, the questions that we'd like to pose for people to consider what they'd like to hear next. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Joe. That was fantastic. 
and Bob. Um, uh, so now we're going to run a poll, uh, and um, and we'd like you, the the audience, to make selections of what you'd like the panel to discuss. Um, and we'll start the panel discussion uh, based on the results of the poll. So we'll give you um, maybe 30 seconds to a minute to answer the questions, and then we'll put up the results of the poll and, uh, and, and start the discussion accordingly. Um, so, you know, the things we can discuss are success stories. Everyone on this panel has a success story that they can, that they can share with you, at least one success story that they can share with you. Um, uh, I'm sure everyone would be happy to talk about their own specific area of expertise uh, and uh, also how some of the specifics about how a collaboration might influence the progression of a project. Um, the panel members are all strategic thinkers who can provide guidance on operational excellence and uh, do a lot of cross-functional uh, collaboration with other members of the team and other uh, parts of the process. And they're all experts uh, at matrix decision making and have uh, done collaborations in the past. So. Whatever you're interested in, uh, give us two selections and we'll, uh, we'll start the panel discussion accordingly. So I don't, um, I think that uh, we can, there we go. So this is the result of the poll that we've gotten so far. Um, uh, and, uh, success uh, story. Yes. So, All right. uh, so, so yes, yeah, so. Let's, let's start, let's start with a success story and again, uh, thanks, Dan. And um, uh, this is going to be off the off the cuff. We really don't have a lot uh, kind of prepared for this, uh, but we are uh, having uh, someone uh, taking notes as well, and so we'll be able to share some of this. Uh, but I, I I'd like to start with a success story, uh, and and kind of bring in uh, Joe and Yun Chang. And so uh, this recently. Uh, we had a client that uh, came to us where they were getting good uh, early uh, PK studies. They were getting good exposures. It was a medicinal chemistry batch, and uh, they used chromatographic isolation, <clears throat> lyophilization. The material was amorphous. Uh, it was a free base material. They were getting good exposures. And then, uh, so all of their lots of material, they only had several grams of material, but it was all amorphous. Then all of a sudden, they uh, saw a drop in their exposures by uh, 70 or 80 percent, and noticed that something was precipitating in their in their PK vehicles. And uh, looking at the molecule <clears throat> early on with area with certain areas of expertise that we have, you could tell that probably 95 percent that this was going to crystallize eventually. And that we couldn't tell necessarily what the difference in solubility was going to be, but it was going to be a definitely a large difference in solubility. So they did crystallize, and then it came to kind of a panic area, right, where now what do we do? Uh, do we go to a salt form? Do we go to a dispersion? Do we mill the material? Uh, what, you know, what are we going to do to get our similar exposures that we had previously? And the issue with this client um, was uh, originally that they were working with a medicinal, just a medicinal chemistry group, and they weren't able to provide enough material to be able to do the, the studies that we're looking to do. And so really kind of the partnership was we're able to get material. So as soon as we found out it was crystalline, uh, the solid state group characterized it, but it, we didn't characterize it <clears throat> to understand all the polymorphs in the system. We just wanted to see basically a risk assessment of how, the, how to move the compound forward in the, in the fastest fashion, right? So we needed more material. So it required process research groups to start making more of the material and actually starting to look at a crystallization because now the material is crystallizing where they can get the purity upgrade. We, we then wanted to make sure that that was uh, going to be uh, 
not necessarily the most stable form, but it was going to be close to the most thermodynamically stable form, if that even makes sense. Uh, but we can run some quick thermodynamic uh, form screening, screenings to understand that. But then we immediately needed to get Yun Chang involved and the formulator involved and formulation research involved because we then had to decide, well, do we have, we're going to have to formulate this material. So do we need to mill it? Do we need to make a dispersion? And so we were able to quickly make uh, several small batches from, you know, we, we got the API from process chemistry, got made several uh, small batches of jet milled material, of uh, dispersion material, and unmilled material, and then we're able to formulate those materials to really determine and make a quick decision on what was the appropriate form to go forward with for the formulation. But simultaneously then, we worked with the process chemistry group to design their crystallization now that there was a crystalline form available. Now, uh, if this was done in a siloed approach, then you, you'd have to go to the subject matter expert to figure out, figure out the form issue, then figure out the formulation, then come back and figure out the crystallization. Um, and so that, that is uh, one, one success story. I've got many of them, but uh, one of the most recent success stories of especially kind of how we were able to uh, collaborate together to move this program forward quickly. Um, and so maybe I'll, I'll throw it over to, to Joe to see if you want to put anything in on this or, or Yun Chang. Yeah, so Young Chang, why don't you uh, make a couple comments because I have another very short success 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 story. Sorry. So Young Chang, I'd, I'd like for you to go ahead and uh, make a couple oh. comments. I know you have many of them that's in your shop. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Bob. So actually, regarding the success story, so um, uh, I'm the formulator. I'm from Kendo Pharma Tech. So I have 18 years experience in formulation, in dissolution, in vitro and in vivo correlation, and also gastroplast simulation. So I have the experience, I know how to hit the target drug absorption profile in, in vivo. So Bob mentioned the success story and we work together. So we identified, you know, the, as I <laughs> Bob mentioned that the one web vehicle, the, uh, the PK data, it cannot be justified from scientific perspective. You cannot just, you cannot just, you cannot justify it. You can, from formulation perspective, from scientific perspective, from biopharmaceutics uh, drug absorption perspective, they are contradictory to our uh, uh, knowledge, you know, experience. And so we, we worked with uh, Bob and we, Bob's team, uh, uh, Crystal Pharmatech New Jersey, and we, I, we, we did the solution, actually. We did the solution. We find the solution reflect so the in vivo, the animal in vivo data. So the dissolution tells, the discriminatory dissolution method tells you know that uh, this uh, formula gets such why it gets such a low PK data, and we send it to Bob's team to do the physical characterization, and we find something changing. So that's verified. Okay, so it's a very good collaboration. It's a very good success story. Fantastic. And I um um and I don't know if there's any questions that's come up on the chat at all, uh, John. Um, so if there is, you know, we could definitely yeah, just jump in, jump in with questions uh, th and that, that'll drive the process oh. as well. <laughs> well, the, the um, uh, I don't know, Joe, did you want to talk about any uh, success stories also? Sure. I, I have a very simple one. That's actually um, and I think it what I want to highlight is if you don't do the right thing at the right time, you get into a lot of trouble. So, for example, uh, We've recently worked with the company um, and they want to do a phase three study uh, here in the U.S. with their compound and they're filing uh, their compound um, in a country um, and it's been well received by the authorities. They're a version of the FDA and they're ready to move forward for the commercialized product. So they asked us to make the material to get ready for their phase three supplies. They want us to do all the um, the, the the critical process parameters and understand the fate and purge and everything that you do to get ready for a NDA filing or for a phase three and they wanted that for their country the equivalent of an NDA filing so we proceed with the chemistry 
Um, and then we found out many multiple things at the same time. So when we made the material for the first time, their API of the salt form they wanted, um, they had a hydrate and they didn't know it. Uh, well, this is a phase three molecule. <laughs> they didn't know they had a hydrate. Um, and also the XRPD that they had originally was very different than the one that we got working with Bob. And so it became clear <laughs> this is a major issue. And so to Bob's expertise and working with us, we're able to do then crystallization conditions to obviate that. Then we found out that this compound can change and that you really have to have what we would call back in the day a water activity relationship or here was a specific uh, uh, molecule so we could definitely do that um, and then by controlling the amount of water we can then obviate this hydrate and make it anhydrous which is what they had done their stability studies on so the good news is we're able to resolve the problem but think about a company that's their main compound and they want to go to a phase three in the u.s and they have all their stability data and they've already filed for the nda to another company and they don't know what form they have that, ladies and gentlemen, is a major issue. And lucky for them, they had the expertise of 30 years with myself and Chris Laniaki, um, and you know over 500 molecules we've taken into the venue of development. And we worked with Bob's team to be able to resolve this issue. And then we have controlled crystallization conditions. We can make the desired API form. It supports their material. Um, and also, we didn't have a chance to work with Young Chang, but we told them very quick, clearly, make sure this material has the same solubility properties that you need in a formulation. And the good news is they're making an alpha-lized product, so it's a non-issue. But that just gives you an example of one little thing about form. If it's not followed up and understood, it can make tremendous disadvantage. Yeah, and and also I I don't I don't want people to think that this is front loading. So we're not talking about front loading research and development. It's, uh, going back to the, the case study I was talking about, um, we, we wouldn't say do a full polymorph screening early on, but what we will say is that you could look at the molecule and say that it's most likely gonna crystallize. And so let's put a little bit of effort to see if it crystallizes. And so what, what, what you do is you take a look at the program early on from a risk assessment standpoint and see what are the, what are the true risks. and you can you can actually then get the process research not that they have to start the gmp campaign that early but if you're thinking about that with that line of sight then you can start to do your process development to to do your process optimization and not have to do a chromatographic i and i think most of our most of the clients we work with are thinking let's just you know get material from a you know fte from another cro that they have really great medicinal chemists and you know it doesn't really matter what the form is and maybe nine times or eight times out of ten or four times out of ten i don't know what the statistics are but you know uh they're waiting they're looking for a purity upgrade they're looking for a white flow of a powder but they're not concerned about form and and so you know it's not it's not about front loading it's about right loading and really understanding what your issues are going to be and to look with that line of sight of you know, if we do this small amount of work at this point, make a couple of small batches to let the formulator play around with the material and formulate the material and understand the dissolution profiles and understand the, the, the pharmacokinetics profiles, making, you know, fast, uh, effective decisions on form and formulation while, uh, you know, while you're scaling up your, your, your process. And that's the other thing, too, is that the silo approach is not even just, it's a mindset, right? And so typically in a, in a large pharmaceutical company, the formulators don't get along with the process chemists, the process research scientists, and the solid state scientists, right? So this is a mindset, right? So this is a mindset that says, hey, everyone matters, everyone's research matters if we want to actually get to their our endpoint faster. And a, a clear example of this was the other week, a very, very reputable process research group uh, was doing a GMP campaign and they had a full polymorph screening salt selection, very, very good research uh, done in the same lab. Um, and uh, in scaling up the GMP process, they had a polymorph issue in their crystallization. And, and in discussion with the with the engineer and the chemist, they said, well, I dissolved the material. How's it going to come out another form? Right. And so and, and, and so it's it's 
you know, respecting every scientist in the in in your circle, you know, in your Venn diagram, and realizing that what you're doing impacts the formulators, impacts the uh, process research, and and impacts the clinical data. And and if you work together in in, in a collaborative effort, you can get there faster. And and I just want to make one more comment about that. And so my example of a compound that was in late stage. If they'd have done a very simple screen and just like very simple conditions to look at the crystallization, they would have found this other form, but they didn't look for it and they didn't know how to look for it. And so having expertise to understand that and have the years of experience to know exactly what to look for, that makes a huge difference for acceleration. The last thing I'll mention to what Bob said about the expertise, there's people who are phenomenal in the knowledge of formulation our API synthesis, our solid state. But as Bob has highlighted multiple times, they're in their silo. And so what's critical, what this team provides is not only do we understand our own area of expertise, but I was very fortunate to work two years in formulation development. Chris Aniaki ran a pre-formulation team and a solid state form. Young Chang has done multiple formulations, pre-formulations, working with multiple forms and how to get ore viability. So we understand each other's area. So not only are we experts in our own, but having an understanding and appreciation and know when to pull all that information together to make a decision that's going to impact either acceleration or no go, no go, no go decisions or what else do we need to make this be successful? So having that strategic intent and that line of sight by doing it multiple, multiple times and looking at all the different scenarios that can happen over 30 years for all of us individually, more than 100 years experience, we know what to expect. It's pretty difficult to find something we haven't seen. And therefore, by pulling that knowledge together and the understanding and appreciating and respect of what our other discipline brings to us, we can then work in this collaborative effort to deliver acceleration into the development and back and beyond from phase one. So Dan, do you wanna see what other question might've been yeah, highlighted from the uh, participants or John? Uh, yeah, well, let's do that. Let's take a um, sure. let's take a question from the audience. We do have a few questions uh, that have been submitted already. Um, and one question is uh, Joe asking you about your from Michael asking you about the graph, right? That moves arrows to the left right, for the yes. IND and tox. How are you preparing material for that tox study for the GMP part of that tox study? And how do you ensure an appropriate impurity profile. So I think that actually I'd like to hear the responses well from everybody on that particular question. Well, I'll take a stab at it first. Um, okay. What's really important as you work through a process, you get to the final API as quick as you can with the appropriate form as quick as you can. That's going to lead to the ore bioavailability that's required for the talk study, which then becomes the foundation of what you can then expect in the clinic. So having the right form, having a process to make that API that delivers an impurity profile with the desired form that gives the desired or by availability is what the identified form needs to be. When you do that, that impurity profile is then created based on that process to deliver that form. And typically, by crystallization, controlled crystallization, you get the desired form and you reject impurities. Now, that rejection of impurities, that impurity profile that you have, that should be the basis of how you're going to use that material for your safety assessment study. Typically, what we do are two scenarios. One, we'll make a GMP, a non-GMP, a GLP material to support a tox study. And that's usually around greater than 97 area percent pure. When we make the GMP material, if it's a separate campaign, then we would try to make that greater than 97 area percent and definitely no new impurities in that material. So whatever you have in that tox batch, that impurity profile will be qualified to support the foundation of your clinical studies beyond. Okay, so that GMP campaign then typically is greater than 98 area percent and those impurities are less and no new impurity in that GMP campaign that was done in the talk study. The other scenario is you make one batch, which is gonna support your talk study and the GMP campaign. In that scenario, again, you gotta work with the pre-formulation person, Young Chang, for example, can do pharmaceuticals to make sure that you can deliver the desired or by availability that's needed. 
the formulation, the, the physical measurement solid state has to be done for the desired form to equate to that with stability. And then you make the API and you make that in one GMP campaign so that you know that impurity profile is hopefully going to be greater than that 98 area percent or minimally 97 area percent. And now that material will be used for your safety assessment study with the vehicle that the pre-formulation work that Young Chang has done for that safety vehicle with the desired form. You do that safety study and then that same API will go to the formulation development which has been being done in parallel with someone like a Candu Farmers uh, by a PharmaTech or like a Crystal PharmaTech with that API. And then that formulation will be developed to support phase one. So that's how it's mapped out. And that acceleration occurs because it's not a handoff. It's everybody yeah. working together to allow that acceleration to happen. And that's the key is it's not a handoff, right? And so I'm, I kind of brought this screen back up again to show the parallel sure. development. Every compound is going to be different, though. We don't want to say that this is the way to, you know, go after, after every compound. But <clears throat> getting the formulator, the formulation research, and the process research, and the solid state analytical at the, at, at the team together is critical because you have to understand your particle attributes that are going to work for your formulation. So you just can't deliver... API to certain purity and 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 even if it even if it's the right salt form and say okay formulate it you know I'm not throwing it over the fence your formulator has to get involved to start doing for early formulation development on material that uh, is going to have the similar crystal form and similar similar particle attributes and get an understanding of what are the key particle attributes when I say attributes I mean like particle size morphology etc. Uh, and and so your GMP campaign will actually then give you material that's the right crystal form with the right particle size that then will go into into the formulation for phase one, but it has that visibility for formulation into much later than phase one. A lot of the formulations now, if you do in a not if you do in a handoff siloed approach, not not that I mean uh, I'm not going to put down any types of formulations, but they're formulations that really don't have visibility in the longer term studies. And I know that's a, you know, people look at that and say, well, I just want to get to phase one. I just want to get to phase one. But if you look at the end in mind and say, I want this to be a product, it's, it, you can actually save money and it's not front loading. It's, it's doing the right amount of work at the right amount of time so that you know and have that line of sight and visibility into not only the clinic, but into the market. And it's going to make for a better product, and it's going to make for happier patients. Uh, yes, yes. I want to uh, I want to add uh, one point from formulation perspective. I think that Joe and uh, Bob mentioned very well. So in order to accelerate molecules to medicines from formulation perspective, how we do it, you know, that as Joe mentioned, so we can actually we can run these tasks in parallel. Okay, so Joe will, their ECG gray cam will provide non-GMP material. We can start with that right away. Okay, we don't need to wait. We, we can start, we run in parallel. While they are pre make preparation for the GMP materials, we, are, we use their non-GMP material. We can develop the formulations fit for the purpose. It means we develop the preclinical pre -clinical formulations fit for the PK study, fit for the pharmacology study, fit for the tox study. We develop based on the animal species. We develop different IV injectables, oral solutions, suspensions, capsules, or even tablets. We can do it. This is one thing. So second thing, once we get the preclinical formulation, uh, preclinical study result positive, so we can immediately using their uh, GMP material to finalize these formulations. This is the second point. We are, we are very fast. We run in parallel. So this same time. The second point is, so we find that during our, you know, we can do the CRO for formulation development. We, we have a lot of experience in preclinical formulation development. We also have a lot of experience on clinical formulation development. We find that there is a gap. So when, they, when, when the biotech companies or farmers, they send their materials, they do the preclinical study, they use their preclinical CRO to prepare the, the suspensions or solutions, whatever. Okay, and they got the result. Sometimes they got the result is inconsistent consistent and cannot be reproduced, cannot be justified, as I mentioned. So why? So we pay a lot of attention to clinical formulation development. 
but I find that there is a gap. So we didn't pay much attention to put, to put the control strategy on the preclinical formulation development. Okay, so if there is something wrong on the preclinical formulation and you dose the animal and you got nothing, or you got the misleading result, and you, your result cannot justify, cannot interpret your, you know, your dosing or your purpose. So that, that one waste your time, waste your money, or even waste the molecule. So I find that one also very important part. I think quality by design for formulation is not only for clinical formulation, also need to put in place for the preclinical formulation. We can do what we do approach is we develop the preclinical formulation for our client and we, we have a control strategy on it and we do the dissolution testing and we match, we compare the dissolution testing of the different formulations against the animal study result. So PK study result, AUC and CMAX, we see they are matching or not. From this perspective, the IV-IVC, the in vitro in vivo correlation is not only suitable for the clinical study, for the human being, it's also suitable, applicable to the preclinical studies. If you can match this, okay, your, your in vitro dissolution with your animal PK result, you get the IV-IVC, the kind of the sense of the IV-IVC. Based on that, you can go to the further stage. You can develop your free type of your clinical formulation for the first in human trials. Okay, so you basically you 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 use your preclinical formulation. You gain insight. Okay, how this formulation is developed? What is the drug release mechanism? How to improve the bioavailability? You use that kind of mechanism to to apply to for your clinical formulation development. So we keep the preclinical formulation and the clinical formulation aligned. So this is very difficult to, to be successful in the clinical formulation. That is uh, my point. Yeah, and, yeah, and thanks, thanks, Yun Cheng. There's an echo. I don't know uh, who's echoing. Uh, <laughs> I see that uh, the organizer has put other people on mute. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and so I wanted to come back to this, uh, to Yin Cheng's point about formulation, but even earlier than that, and talking about the matrix approach, right? And so um, really the matrix approach to the decision-making, it, it, so I'd like to bring up the case of the salt selection, right? And so uh, back in the day, you know, we would, we do salt selection with these working groups where you had input from not only the solid state scientists, or uh, but you'd have input from the formulators, from the process research, analytical, because it's a, it's a it's a decision. And we had a panel discussion on this previously. You know, it's it's a it's a holistic decision on the salt selection, and and so uh, and, and the way to do that is really getting the formulator and the process chemist and engineer on board and at the table at the right time and not doing, so I still, and I don't wanna harp on it, I see a lot of very, very good research on say a salt or a form selection, but about one one hundredth of that data is actually taken into the formulator and into the process chemist to, to process research and, and to actually make an informed decision of the proper salt. Right, so choosing the salt is not just about a good CRO that does salt selection. It's about putting a collaborative effort with the formulator. Well, how's this going to impact format uh, formulation? How's this going to impact you know exposures? But then also from a, from a process research, is this going to give me my best purity upgrade? Is this going to is this going to be easy to crystallize slash uh, control the particle size? And so. Something very, I'd say, straightforward like a salt selection, you, something like that, you can't even treat as a unit operation. It's better to have this collaborative partnership where the the right people are at the right table making this making the decisions. And I, I'd like to comment on that also. I think you know, and Bob, thanks for bringing that uh, to the forefront again around the matrix decision making, which was one of the key questions I think that came up from the poll. Um, and the other thing around matrix decision making, as I highlighted before, you have to have people who are making the decisions and bringing the data forward, how that data impacts the other person's operations or, or their science. So understanding 
that wow, we got to scale this material, and I can make a, a I can make a hundred grams, but I want to make a kilo and then ten kilos and a hundred kilos. Well, let's do first time right, as Chris Saniaki says all the time. It's our mantra at TCG Green Chem: first time right. So let's look at the chemistry. Let's look at the molecule itself. We can take a recipe and we can scale that. But what we prefer to do is look at that optimize, and if if there's an opportunity to enhance and streamline and accelerate the development of that chemistry, we'll do that. And with our tools of high throughput experimentation, we have catalysis screening, uh, we have all the trademarks of what I had access at Merck and Chris had at Berngo Ingelheim to be able to do this high throughput analysis and really look at reaction design and engineering laboratory is what we have, an automated reaction design engineering laboratory. We are using crystallization experts with Bob's team. We are thinking about pre-formulation with um, can do pharmaceutical young Chang's team. We were then thinking that we have a crystallization engineer who has 20 years experience from Merck, from AbbVie, from BMS Celgene of less developed the crystallization first time for the first kilo. So that process is now scalable and it delivers the right particle size. It delivers the right API form. It delivers the crystalline salt as needed. And it's gonna allow us to accelerate into the talk study, into the phase one, and then phase two, we're ready to go with the additional optimization that occurs to get ready for phase two. So this matrix decision-making, line of thought, what is needed to go from this point to that point and not do it sequential, right? But do it collectively, collaboratively, as a partnership, sharing knowledge of people understanding the knowledge that's garnered. So then you can use that and make sure what you deliver as an API to the formulation development, they know it's already what they need. And then they can make the formulation directly and the stability, the profile of how it's going to be absorbed, dissolved, et cetera. All that's being done in parallel. So that matrix decision is Young Chang may say, hey, Joe, this material you're making, it's rock solid. There's no ore bioavailability. It's like, we got to do a spray dry intermediate, or we got to do something right. different. Bob's like, okay, well, what about the other salt forms we had? Well, let's look at those, that polymorph. And then we looked at, we, we, we do all those experiments. And in a matter of weeks, we say, okay, this one's no good. That's no good. This looks good. Okay, we've got to go spray dry intermediate. Boom, we're going to use this form. We can make it. We can do the crystal engineering, reproduce it. Oh, it gives you right impurity profile. Good, let's go. Uh-oh, it doesn't reject as impurity. Okay, let's retool it. Let's retweak it. Boom, 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 boom. You pull all that together. Okay, now we have the right thing. Move forward. That cannot okay. happen in a siloed approach. No, no exactly. Way. Yeah, and Joe, yes. Joe, Joe, you're right. And I, I'm sorry, Joe, it's interjecting you again, right. which which I do all the time. Uh, sorry about that. But uh, the yeah, I mean the 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 silo, it, But but this isn't new, right? I mean this is correct. You know, when Dan mentioned we had over 100 years of experience, th this is done all the time, and it's just that right. in the contract research world, it's not done. And and I, I at least I don't see it happen as much. And I you know I think that just just getting your CRO bigger and bigger and bigger and offering having more offerings does not does not a smart development company make you uh, so to speak right. And it, and and so what this model is is really you know having that. Uh, driving the project forward, but also having the labs to get it done immediately, right? So if, all right, I need four different particle sizes or two different particle sizes and I need two different salts. Well, I'll, I'll make it for you here. You know, uh, Joe, Joe's group will give us 10 grams of material. We'll make three grams of each, ship it over to Yin Chang and have him, you know, do the formulation development and see, and we'll, you know, run animal studies, et cetera, right? So it's, it's, it's not really just the consulting on it. And it's not just the project management, but it's having the right mindset of scientists that are going to drive the drive the project to 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 the end point. Um, and so, uh, yeah, sorry, just wanted to interject that, Joseph. <laughs> well, yeah, so I, go, go ahead, Dan. I, I do have oh. one other comment. I think it's really critical. <laughs> Why does this collaborative partnership work? And it's based in trust. You have to understand the scientists you work with and you have to trust the science that's being delivered based on the data because we all have to make decisions based on data. You have to trust the people who are providing the data. You have to know that that person providing the data is looking at it from their perspective and they can present to you their data with their critical evaluation of that data. And then collectively, we talk about that and then we can make decisions. So, for example, Bob is 20 minutes from our facility here at Princeton South. 
right? Young Chang is an overnight FedEx of material to him. Yeah. And in two days, we can have decisions and we can be having discussions, right? Bob, yes. I've known for over 22 years. We're great friends inside, outside, but I understand his knowledge, his technology, what he did at Merck, what he's done at Crystal Pharmatech from the very beginning. He understands my expertise. He knows Chris Naniaki's expertise. We are learning what expertise that Young Chang has, which is amazing in the world of, you know, um, spray dried intermediates, enhancing ore bioavailability, looking at uh, looking at vehicles for formulation for safety assessment, understanding how to have that path directly into line of sight for phase one and phase two formulation. That kind of expertise and understanding and trust and collaborative nature of sharing information and challenging each other. You gotta be able to challenge data, right? Having that trust allows you to do that and that respect for each other. Yeah. And not having and not having, say, myself go, we have to go with the HCL salt because it has these type of properties. It it it, it, it can't be it can't be a single point of contact decision. It has to be made with a group. And and this is this is your circle of your your Venn diagram of trust right here, Joe. I think the center of there is in there. Perfect. So so Dan, are there other questions? We want to uh, address other questions. Uh there is a, there's a couple of other questions. Yeah. Um uh but what, well, maybe we can spend a few minutes. We have a few minutes before uh, we can get to a couple of questions. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about uh, sort of the next topic that the audience wanted to hear about, which was the combination of strategic thinking and op operational excellence and how that impacts uh, collaboration. So we only have maybe uh, six or seven minutes and then maybe take a couple of questions. So maybe you guys can comment a little bit on that. Joe, do you want to take and, that one? Is uh, the strategic Sorry. the strategic yeah. thinking one, did you yeah, want to take I, that at yeah. OPEX? Yeah, I can definitely take a stab at that. So we've kind of been dancing around this whole idea of strategic thinking. Strategic thinking really talks about line of sight. If you want to move a molecule from here, that's in pre that's a preclinical candidate that just came out of lead optimization, and you want to go into phase one, but then you also want to get into the phase two. You want to make sure what all the decisions you make to accelerate into phase one are not going to limit you in phase two. In other words, why would you use a compound that has very low solubility in a dry filled capsule that may not give you the ore bioavailability of exposure you need to hit the desired target in the clinic, and you may have to reformulate it. Why not answer that question first by going, hey, this solubility is low. Young Chang goes, the ore bioavailability is not what we need. And we're like, okay, let's change the form. Let's change the delivery method. That's a strategic decision. And that you know you could get by with phase one probably, but that doesn't take you where you want to go. Now, if you're a biotech company and you want to increase valuation of what you're doing, then maybe that's okay. But if you're a company that wants to, el to elongate your lifetime based on going to phase two and beyond with your own company, then you want to think about, okay, I want to go to phase one, but I want to make sure that whatever I do to prepare for phase one, it allows me to get into phase two. And not only do I not want it to prepare to go to phase two, hey guys, it'd be great if you could have to accelerate not only in phase one, but accelerate in the phase two. Now that's dependent upon the clinical protocol, but there you go. Yeah, and and that so I I want to interject and say that that's for the biotechs though it's it it matters right so so it's even if you only only want to take your compound to phase one, the CMC part when you're going to sell that compound, the, the it, it it's going to be a part of it right it's not going to be I mean obviously you know the clinical et cetera are going to drive it but you know if you have that line of sight into phase two and beyond your gold product goes to a platinum product instead of getting x Agreed. million you get y million right and so that line of sight is can really increase the value of your intellectual property which is your compound and it doesn't cost and i think that's the main thing i want to get at is if you do it right it's actually cheaper i think because you you you, you don't repeat studies you do the right work at the right time. You don't say, you know, make five different salts and do, you know, it, it, it all gets done in a, in a in a strategic manner by uh, subject matter experts from the from the different areas that aren't going to waste. That, that we're, we're we're used to not wasting resources, right? And so, um, yeah. Yeah, uh, from strategic uh, thinking perspective, from formulation perspective, I want to add some comments. Okay, so from for formulation development, strategic thinking is your stra formulation strategy. 
Okay, you need to do do the formulation right first time. How to do that? So no matter is for preclinical formulation or clinical formulation, right? So we want to you need to know how to in order to improve the drug uh, bioavailability or drug exposure. So you will need to know the drug absorption is limited by the solubility or limited by dissolution or limited by permeability. Okay, we need to very clear, keep it very clear. All these depend on the dose. Okay, your dose is low, your dose is medium dose or is high dose. Your formulation strategy needs to change. Second point, we also need to decide, you know, your, your dosing, your, your potential, you know, clinical dosing, your dosing regimen, okay, your treatment, your treatment is for chronic or is fast onset effect. So we need to decide. So it's immediate release dosage form or it's extended release dosage form, which will provide the best therapeutic efficacy, right? We need to know that. So then that you, you, you design your formulation strategy based on the, the physical chemical properties of the drug molecule, based on the polymorph salt, salt form, the, the most stable salt form, the most stable polymorph, and also based on the TCG pharmacam, they are very good at process development. They always provide from the scale up, from small scale to large scale, they provide the consistent API supply. That is very important for the formulation development. Many companies, they, when they scale up, they, they are, they are, their API properties change significantly. That constitutes a significant challenge for formulation development. No matter, so it's very, so all this we need to, work together, work collaboratively, so as a team. So that is, uh, I think that is uh, very important for the product development. That is also a part of the uh, strategic thinking. So and, I'd like and, to take uh, one point final comment, if I may, Bob, on that. Um, we haven't spoken a lot about process research itself, and we've talked a lot about strategies. So in the world of process research, Young Cheng has highlighted exactly the critical aspect from a process research perspective. Number one, when you make a molecule, it's got to be reproducible, ro robust. We at TCG Green Cam, we pride ourselves on a track record of, of multiple decades in the pharmaceutical arena and process research that we develop a environmentally friendly, sustainable green chemistry process that delivers high purity every time, desired particle size as needed every time, Des that desired impurity profile every time. It doesn't have to be reworked. Right, which costs you a lot of money. So having the right process, first right time of how you make a molecule, how you deliver that molecule and do the crystallization at the end to give you that impurity profile, which has to lock in, as I highlighted earlier in this conversation of the safety assessment study that locks in and qualifies your impurities, you cannot change that impurity profile. The only time you change it is when you make it more pure. And that's what we do. So that first phase one delivery of GMP material, that impurity profile will never be compromised on the way that Chris and I design and deliver chemistry. And we do that in an accelerated manner, as I highlighted. So that, again, when you make a kilo to five kilos, that impurity profile stays the same. That form stays the same. So Young Cheng doesn't have to modify his formulation because the form changed or he's got a different particle size or the impurity profile, oh, what do we do It's change? Because what other people have done in the past is they use a process to get to one or two kilos and they chromatograph or they do whatever they get to get material and then it can't be reproduced or it can't be scaled appropriately or the crystal engineering wasn't done appropriately. And so it's a three day filtering process and you start getting degradus and et cetera, or entrainment of impurities. So doing that part of the chemistry of generating the API is critical to provide line of sight, to go from phase one to phase two and beyond, and also supports the formulation development as they move forward. And development means, okay, you can make a tablet or capsules and typically a capsule for the first, you know, uh, thousand to 2000 capsules for the single dose and the multiple dose study. But to go into phase two, well, maybe we want to transform that into a tablet. So understanding those properties of the API that don't change and they're locked in, because we've thought about that already with Young Chang's line of sight, he can move into a tablet, right? So those kinds of things are kind of lost in the fray of getting chemistry out quickly that's not scalable or reproducible for the long term or thinking about those other deliveries beyond. And then making sure the molecule doesn't change its form which is with Bob's support from Crystal Pharmatech, and delivering that desired particle size and impurity profile, which is critical to any drug development strategy, pulling all that together 
and then moving that to phase one and two with that line is like the matrix decision, that collaborated effort, real time decisions. That's where you're going to get in this collaborative approach. And that's what every pharmaceutical company does. This is not reinventing the wheel. Yeah. We've actually yeah. greased right. the wheel and our right. roles in pharma. And now we're showing we can do this as our own independent companies in a collaborative effort to support you, the client, to take your molecule to a medicine. Thanks, and, and 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 Dan, thanks for putting up this slide because uh, the next the next speaker next uh, May nineteenth is a great example of this, uh, uh, Sean. And I don't want to give away the the secret, but I, you know he originally came to us and said he needed a co-crystal, and 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 you know we could have very easily just taken the work and found a co-crystal for him. But you know if we dig down and really look at his formulation issues it was it was a formulation issue right so bringing in yun chang immediately we took him away from the co-crystal and said okay what's your real issue for this project and how do we really move you forward and so that's what we're talking about right and and so maybe dan is are there any remain uh, other questions um we have uh there's a couple of other questions um but we're kind of running out of time. So maybe uh, we'll ask one question quick, uh, three minutes we have left. Um, and yeah, and then maybe if you some, take two minutes uh, and get back to me. Um, are you proponents of powder in capsule for phase one? <laughs> so, Joe, go for it. I, yeah, I, I'll take the, so um, that's a great question. From the, per, from the point of acceleration, powder in a capsule can really help accelerate. There's other ways that you can do acceleration into phase one beyond powder in a capsule. It really depends on the solubility of that powder. So again, circling the wagons, looking at that molecule, looking at that form, understanding the polymorph, the stability, the ore bioavailability, those things all in concert that we've spoken to. If you don't have solubility of that powder in a capsule, it's a huge waste of a phase one study. You have to show that you're going to get the ore bioavailability needed to get to a, a level of a blood level in the human in the clinical, you know, in the human clinical study, so you can hit the target blood level needed to hit the the receptor of whatever it is. So power in a, power in a capsule, I'm a huge fan of it. I did it at Merck and accelerated programs because we had highly soluble molecules. They were BCS class one or three, right? Greater than a mg per mil solubility. Power in a capsule works great for that. If it's low solubility. It's extremely difficult, and I would say a waste of time. But I can ch chunk it over to Young Chang and have him make but, a couple comments uh, quick. Actually, what I'd like to comment on that is, at the very least, you need to know what your particle size is, and what's driving your particle size, and what your form is, so that if you need to come yes. back, you can then you can then uh, turn those triggers and say, okay, I can get my particle size bigger. But if you're just coming out with lumps, agglomerated lumps, because you've got a crash a crash stilization, so to speak, in your GMP campaign, then you know, are you gonna be able to reproduce those properties? It all comes back to understanding the triggers that trigger your particle attributes and can you reproduce what you're getting? And exactly. so I'll throw it over to Yin Chang and what do you wanna talk about powder in the capsule a little bit? Yes, yes good. Uh, thank you, Joe and uh, Bob. You two talked very well. So I want Yo, to add Chang, one point. Me, well, I, I don't mean to cut you off, but but we're officially over. I mean, we're okay. officially out of time, but we can still go and we still have people in the audience. Let's, so let's I would let's say, yeah, let's yeah, let yeah, let's yeah absolutely. I would say we just, uh, like Young Chen, you can finish and we'll stay online. I think we can stay online for another few minutes. Yeah, uh, I but I'm not cutting us, I'm not cutting you off. I'm just telling you that, uh, sure, sure. Uh, <laughs> right, we're at sure. the, we're near the end. Sure, sure. I just take one minute. I think some audience may be uh, interested in this question. I think Joe and uh, Bob mentioned very well. I just from the manufacturing, from the formulation perspective, I add my comments to it. I think it will be helpful to the audience. Okay, so powder in capsules, the challenge, one of the biggest challenges is the powder flow. Okay, is the powder flow. So when you do it, you use a machine encapsulation, encapsulator you do, there is a powder flow issue, right? So from my perspective, I think that, you know, because this is for the clinical formulation, so you get the insight from your pre, uh, this is for the clinical formulation, you get insight from animal formulation already, right? So how the drug will dissolve, what is the drug release mechanism? You apply the same mechanism, and but you need to use the excipient, okay? Use the excipient. 
uh, to improve the powder flow or maybe you can i don't think uh, if it is not directly encapsulation so you can do the roller compaction to improve the powder flow then it will make uh, you know make your encapsulation process much easier okay so that's workable but keep the excipient limit within iig limit so that is we follow just like a, for the clinical formulation design for human consumption we follow all the rules but you can improve the process encapsulation process i, I think we might want to cut probably cut it off there i guess uh, uh you, yeah we are yeah we're all we're a minute over and um okay. Uh, but I want to thank everybody on the panel and, and certainly for everyone uh, in the audience for attending. Uh, on the screen right now is uh, our, our future webinars and what the intent is, right? As you've seen today, we've introduced the concept uh, of molecules to medicine and our future webinars are going to be uh, some success stories from people who have done this, from people who lead the projects and who lead the companies who have actually been uh, successful with uh, the collaborations that we're talking about. So we hope you all come back and we thank you for uh, attending and um, we'll talk to you soon. Take care, yeah. everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yep.